welcome to the Canadian Society of Echocardiography Virtual Journal Club in collaboration with the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography podcast. My name is Dr. Amar Jori, and it's my pleasure to host this international collaboration to promote the latest literature in the echo world. Today, we will be discussing the paper entitled Performance of Echo Algorithms for Assessment of High Uric Bioprosthetic Valve Gradients by Dr. Rosslyn and corresponding author, Dr. Pislaru. This article appears in the July 2022 issue of the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. We have an amazing panel uh, today, and Dr. Picard is going to help us introduce this panel. And we're going to have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, so please make sure that uh, you can enter questions in the chat function. And also, I wanted to let you know that um, we will let you be unmuted during the last 20 minutes or so if you wanted to speak up uh, as well. So I'm going to just quickly um, hand it over to Dr. Picard. Uh, Mike, can you tell us a, a little bit about um, the editorial process for this paper? Any comments you want to make from your perspective? And uh, maybe you can get us started by introducing uh, some of our authors today. Thanks, Albert. So, um, you know, prosthetic valve function is, I think, one of the challenging things that we do as echocardiographers, and particularly for the, in this paper, we're going to discuss high aortic uh, gradients in bioprosthetic valves. And you know, when you think about, as a you know, for those of, those of you who are sonographers or physicians who are reading these cases, when you encounter an elevated gradient or something that's higher than should be for a specific type of bioprosthetic valve, you start thinking about, is this patient prosthesis mismatch? Is it just high output? Is there obstruction? Is there panis in the outflow track? Um, what else? Thrombus on leaflets now with TAVR valves. We're learning about thrombus formation on leaflets. Uh, uh, reg significant regurgitation can can lead to high flows. And, and so there's a lot of things that we have to think about. And there have been a series of um, uh, algorithms that have been uh, published to help us, to help guide us. And um, this paper, uh, when it when uh, it came to, to Jace, we, the, the editors, uh, first it obviously got really great reviews, but the others uh, when we discussed, we really thought it was a very relevant topic in clinical practice. And so, um, not only did we um, publish it, but but obviously Amr has uh, also identified it as a as a as an important topic to discuss. So um, I think um, I don't want to spill the beans in terms of what the authors uh, identified and assessed because uh, I think that's what we're going to hear from our discussants. But um, but I, I think uh, it, you'll find this will be an interesting discussion and a very relevant one for for what we deal with every day. So let me um, introduce uh, the three panelists. Who are all authors on this paper? Their first author of the paper is uh, Aslan Ibn uh, Roslin. He's coming today from uh, calling in from uh, Malaysia, so he's uh, I guess it's uh, it's past midnight over in that part of the world. So thanks for for joining us. And he um, was I think it's know, Indonesia. Is it Indonesia, Dr. Roslin, or Malaysia? Malaysia. Okay, perfect. Kuala Lumpur. Right. Um, and uh, he was the first author in the paper. Um, I, um, uh, when he was uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, two other um, of the authors are with us, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Pelica, who uh, not only is an author on the paper, but she'll be the incoming editor-in-chief of Jace. So I thought it's great to have her here so that she can um, um, see the process that, that we go through when we do these uh, very successful podcasts. <clears throat> and then um, lastly, uh, the senior author on the paper, uh, uh, Dr. Saran Pizlaru, who, um, in addition to this paper, has published a lot uh, on assessing some of these various algorithms that we deal with, particularly in assessing uh, prosthetic valves of all types. So uh, this is this, this one of many papers in this uh, in this uh, topic that his research group in, uh, deals with. So that's uh, that's sort of the bottom line, Amr. Perfect. Thank you for uh, that introduction, Mike. 
And uh, you mentioned Dr. Pelika, it's coincidental, she's a uh, co-author, and uh, there's a little bit of transition going on at Jace as well. Did you want to just mention that before we dive in? Uh, sure. So uh, let's see, we're in the middle of September. I'm actually just getting ready to put together the November uh, issue, the content that we'll put into the November issue, and then I'll have one more issue, uh, the December issue that I'll be putting together. And uh, then after that, um, I'll be turning the reins over at the end of December to Dr. Pelica. So um, I think one of the uh, important initiatives that, that Patty uh, has just started is that she's looking, uh, she's, she's issued a, a call for papers on valve disease, and she'll be putting together a, early in the, in the 2023, uh, probably in the first quarter, she'll be uh, publishing a, a special uh, focused issue on echocardiography and valve disease. So I would encourage those of you who have papers on this topic that are either nearing completion, get them done and get them in, or uh, if they've been unsuccessful at other journals, uh, we're certainly happy to take a look at them. And we're trying to do a, an expedited review on some of those so that we can get those papers in and in maybe publish in the first quarter of 2023. That's amazing. Patty, did you want to add anything to that? Welcome. Thanks, thanks Amir. Uh, yes, I'm really excited to uh, start that role fully in January. And uh, of course, we're going to continue these podcasts. So um, good that's amazing. We're, we're looking forward to uh, working with you. We had, a, we had a lot of fun with Mike, and I'm sure the fun will continue. So thank you. So um, let's get down to uh, business here. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a collaboration with Canadian Society of Echocardiography. And we have uh, two wonderful members of the Canadian Society of Echocardiography I'm going to introduce to you. Um, the first is Natasha Alexova, who is a recent Echo Fellow who just finished her fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And uh, she was recently hired as a clinical investigator at the Women's College Hospital at University of Toronto. And so I know Natasha because she is a co-investigator with the Arctica project, where we look at point of care ultrasound in remote regions. And so she was instrumental in helping to uh, promote this project and looking at remote point of care ultrasound in uh, geographically remote areas. And I, it was a wonderful opportunity to work with her and continue working with her. So welcome, Natasha. And uh, then we also have Dr. Philippe uh, Pibereau, who is a professor at Laval University. And he uh, is very appropriate for this uh, topic because he holds the Canada Research Chair in Valvular Heart Disease. And he's one of the most um, significant contributors to our field. In fact, he won the, uh, he was awarded the 13th annual Feigenbaum Lecture. And it was actually about Doppler echo for aortic stenosis in 2012. And that particular talk has become legendary uh, because the lights went out. <laughs> and, um, but he continued. <laughs> So uh, hopefully the lights won't go out today. That would be a disaster, but uh, I know we can rely on you in case they do. So uh, why don't we um, go from there? I'm gonna let Natasha start. Uh, so Natasha, you should be allowed to share your screen and uh, you can start with the uh, presentation of the paper today. I'll start. Uh by um, introducing this um, paper, uh, the performance of echocardiography uh, algorithms for the assessment of high aortic uh, bioprosthetic valve gradients. And thank you for the opportunity to present the background, uh, the methods, and some of the results. Um, as we know, the assessment of bioprosthetic valve function remains one of the most challenging problems in echo evaluation. And it relies on a complex integration of 2D and 3D visual cues and Doppler-based indices, depending on the special uh, specific context. We know that high gradients, that is um, aortic velocities more than three meters per second or a mean gradient over uh, or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury are common in patients with bioprosthetic aortic valve dysfunction. Um, I'll call that BAVD for short for the rest of my uh, talk. The mechanisms of BAVD are, are numerous 
and they include prosthetic obstruction by pannus or thrombus, high cardiac output states, increased transvalvular flow due to concomitant prosthetic or periprosthetic regurgitation, patient prosthesis uh, mismatch, as well as pressure recovery phenomenon. We do know that the mechanism of BAB may not be immediately evident, and oftentimes more than one mechanism is present. Importantly, the current evidence to date uh, is, is dated. Uh, the most recent ASC publication on the assessment of uh, prosthetic valve function is over a decade old, and alternative algorithms and guidelines uh, have been published, but they uh, rely on data that precedes the trans um, catheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR era, and were really tailored to diagnose surgical stage BAVD. As percutaneous valve and valve replacement allows earlier intervention in patients who are not surgical candidates, the validity of these algorithms in these patients is not really known. Um, importantly as well, bioprosthetic valve thrombosis was only recently recognized and no study has reported accuracy of these algorithms for this condition. So the purpose of this study uh, was to address these gaps in knowledge and do it in two ways. First, to assess the performance of existing diagnostic algorithms in patients with clinically established mechanism of BAVD. And second, to develop an improved strategy to increase uh, diagnostic accuracy of the mechanism of the valvular dysfunction and classification. In terms of the methods, uh, the study uh, population were patients uh, from the Mayo Clinic at Rochester um, from 2007 to 2020, identified from the uh, electronic medical record. And it's important to note that only those in whom the mechanism of BAVD was unequivocally established were included in the study. Controls were those patients with normally functioning aortic bioprosthesis, and patients and controls were matched one-to-one -one for age, for gender, and for bioprosthesis type and size. As I said, uh, patients that were included had to have objective determination of the mechanism of their bioprosthetic aortic valve dysfunction. And there, this was established unequivocally in three circumstances. The first was patients undergoing surgical valve re-replacement in whom complete surgical pathology, uh, surgical pathological, sorry, and interoperative T reports were available to confirm the diagnosis. Two, in those patients undergoing TAVR in whom pre-op 40 CT and or a TE established the mechanism. Or three, patients who had clinically proven thrombosis, that is a clinical diagnosis with typical echo or CT findings, and in whom anticoagulation restored uh, prosthetic appearance and gradients. Uh, the initial classification uh, was by transthoracic echo, and all parameters incorporated into the current diagnostic algorithms were measured on TTE. For controls, a similar analysis was performed on the selected uh, matched echocardiogram. In terms of the statistical analysis, uh, I want to highlight three important points. Uh, the correlation between continuous burial goals was performed using Pearson's correlation coefficient. The relationship between the mechanism of the valvular dysfunction and echo indices was performed with logistical regression. And receiver operating um, curve analysis or uh, ROC analysis was performed to determine the optimal cutoff values for echo indices of obstruction. Before a, a revised algorithm was defined, patients with um, BAVD and controls with high gradients were classified according to three established algorithms. And you see these images here, uh, the ASC 2009 uh, algorithm at the bottom, the, uh, a paper published by the Mayo Group uh, uh, call from uh, Blauett and Miller in 2014, um, using some of the similar uh, parameters, um, including uh, effective orifice area and acceleration time, et cetera. And the more comprehensive um, 2016 European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging Algorithm was also assessed. After calculating sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy for each of these three algorithms, then a novel algorithm was defined uh, 
for the purposes of minimizing the most common misdiagnosis, uh, misdiagnoses with the current uh, or existing algorithms, the three that uh, I've uh, alluded to here. So uh, in terms of the results, uh, this is the baseline characteristics. Uh, it's, a, it's a big table, but I'll just focus on a couple of important points. The first is that there were 266 patients who had a bioprosthetic aortic valve um, dysfunction. And as you can see, uh, the majority of them had obstruction, that is 191 patients had obstruction as the cause or the mechanism. Um, in terms of controls, there were uh, 266 patients uh, in that arm as well. Uh, just on average, patients were in their early 70s, uh, 74 um, for the, uh, the valvular dysfunction group and 73 for the controls. Um, about a third were female. Uh, ejection fraction was in the normal range. And importantly, uh, what you see here is that surgically implanted valves um, accounted for the majority, the overwhelming majority of the valves studied um, in this paper. Uh, with um, differences in terms of uh, prosthetic type, uh, most apparent for um, the, the small group of patients with patient prosthetic mismatch. The other uh, aspect of this table that I wanted to highlight is at the bottom, and that refers to the echocardiographic indices. And uh, what you can somewhat see, uh, I hope, is that um, there were important uh, statistical differences between the group with um, prosthetic uh, aortic valve dysfunction uh, and the controls, uh, specifically the uh, acceleration time and the peak velocity was much higher in the group um, with BAVD. Uh, and as expected, the indexed EOA and the DVI were much lower. Uh, and as you can see at the bottom of this table, uh, as one might expect, the abnormal visual appearance on TTE uh, was uh, seen in the group with uh, valvular dysfunction, as was moderate or great, greater aortic regurgitation that really wasn't seen in the controls as was intended. This is um, uh, the second uh, important uh, table presented uh, in the results. And here, uh, what you see at the top is the optimal cutoff to detect obstruction. So we're focusing now on the group of patients with obstruction, which was the majority. And when you look at the uh, optimal cutoff for acceleration time, for example, the uh, AUC or the discriminatory power of, of this um, uh, variable uh, was good um, at 100 milliseconds. Similarly, uh, DVI of 0.31 um, had an uh, area under the curve of 0.94, which is also a very good uh, discriminatory power, um, uh, suggesting that these existing cutoffs do work uh, well. However, importantly, and the study author authors do note this as well, when you include only the patients who had high gradients, the um, discrimination or the, uh, the area under the curve uh, values uh, does uh, reduce, uh, suggesting that more information is needed uh, when you're um, making decisions about uh, obstruction by echo. At the bottom of this table uh, is the correlation coefficients uh, looking at various echocardiographic um, indices of obstruction. And as might be expected, um, peak velocity, for example, positively correlates with uh, DVI and um, indexed a uh, EOA and indexed EOA in turn also positively correlates with uh, DVI. Um, it's easier to see this uh, graphically, I think. Uh, so the next two uh, figures that I will present from the results, I think, speak uh, to some of the findings that then Dr. Uh, Pivaro will discuss in a little bit more depth. But this is the uh, uh, echographic indices of obstruction, um, and I'll go through each of these figures. So on the leftmost side um, is acceleration time, and what is apparent is that the acceleration time is significantly higher in the group of patients with obstruction compared to the group of patients with no obstruction who otherwise had bioprosthetic aortic valve dysfunction, and that it is also significantly higher than in the controls as would be expected. Similarly, 
for the Doppler velocity index and the index effective orifice area. The group that had obstruction uh, had much lower values, and that was st statistically lower compared to the group without obstruction and with controls. I think it's important, and the authors do highlight this in, in the paper as well, that um, there's a significant uh, proportion of patients who have uh, BAVD or have bioprosthetic aortic valve dysfunction um, who have acceleration uh, times above 100 milliseconds, uh, um, as well as uh, um, DVIs below 0.3, who don't actually have obstruction, but obviously fall into that range. And here's another um, important um, finding from this paper. Although the relationship wasn't as strong, uh, you can see from these um, scatter plots that acceleration time on the left has a weak but statistically significant inverse correlation with the flow rate. So such that as um, the acceleration time increases, the flow rate decreases. And on the right panel, you see that the Doppler velocity index was moderately correlated with flow, flow rate, such that as the um, DVI is lower and lower, the flow is also um, lower. So I will stop there uh, and hand it over to Dr. Pibaro, who will finish off the results section, as well as the conclusions from this paper. Thank you very much, Natasha. I'm trying to share my screen. Hopefully it will work. Uh, do you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. There you go. Okay. Uh, but I don't see, okay. Uh, I'm going to pass in slideshow mode and everything should be okay now. Um, so thank you, Natasha, for setting up the table so nicely. Um, and 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 I'm. It's a great pleasure for me to to discuss this uh, this great paper and a, another great contribution. And I would like to highlight, you know, that the group at the Mayo, uh, you know, historically has published several very important papers. We know the huge contribution in the field of valvular disease and native valve disease, but I think uh, this paper is another great example on the contribution of this group of the Mayo Clinic uh, on the um, bioprostic valve dysfunction. Uh, so this is an elegant study, uh, a lot of work in this study. Uh, congratulations. And, and, and uh, so uh, this table actually is like, uh, for those of you who remember the uh, matrix uh, calculus, it's like a matrix, okay? So uh, ideally uh, you have several categories and this is actually the performance of what we have in the guidelines. In our guidelines, in the American Society of Gui uh, Guidelines that Natasha presented, this is when you apply the algorithm of the ESE, on this uh, population, um, well, uh, and you have several categories that you can identify with the ASC algorithm. So you have, of course, pathologic obstruction, high flow uh, state, including actually AR, uh, prosthesis patient mismatch. That is maybe the most challenging to differentiate from obstruction uh, because here prosthesis patient mismatch, as you know, is a normal, normally functioning valve, but with elevated gradient. And then there are another category that is more technical issue, measurement pitfalls, et cetera. And then of course the normal. Now ideally, of course, in this matrix, you would like to have as many as possible patients on the diagonal. So uh, on, on this uh, highlighted you know, in bold. And all the numbers that are uh, above the diagonal or uh, below um, actually are misclassified patients. So overall, you know, the ASC uh, algorithm is, is, uh, is quite, uh, quite um, good or reasonable, let's say, but uh, definitely we look at the sensitivity and specificity and well, it is suboptimal. It is in the 60s, 70s, approaching the 80s for some cases. So we can do better for sure. Uh, so now this is uh, the same type of table for the uh, the Blowett uh, Miller uh, Buzz Miller algorithm that has been uh, again was uh, coming from the Mayo Clinic, and I think was a first uh, first step in uh, toward the improvement of the C guidelines. Uh, so they were they were less uh, in in this case. You you see that you have somewhat more patients uh, who are uh, correctly classified, were the uh, true positive cases. 
Um, but still, where you see uh, where we have um, many patients that are, mat who are misclassified as in a prosthesis patient mismatch versus obstruction. This is always the most challenging again. Uh, and also uh, some patients with, with uh, uh, regurgitation uh, that were uh, misclassified uh, obstruction and vice versa. Um, so then uh, in the algorithm that is uh, more recent than the ESC and probably includes more parameter, uh, it's the EACVI uh, classification algorithm. Um, and I, I think with this algorithm, uh, we have some, again, I think some improvement versus ESC, uh, but uh, definitely again, uh, you see that some, some sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity are more now in the 80s, 90s, especially for high flow, uh, for PPM is, is uh, definitely better than what we had with the ESC uh, algorithm. But still, you have, for example, of obstruction, pathologic obstruction, that is probably our main concern that we certainly don't want to miss and that we want to differentiate from a process patient mismatch sensitivity of this algorithm that again is more comprehensive than the AAC1, more multi-parameter, is 64% sensitivity, 77% specificity. This is not enough uh, and we, we need to do better. So this is where, um, you know, the, um, the authors came, came up with this improved algorithm. And I like, you know, um, the way you constructed this paper where you actually looked at all possible algorithms that were in the literature and in the guidelines and well, tested the performance of the algorithm, concluded that, well, yeah, some were pretty good for some categories of this function, but definitely suboptimal for others and try to improve this uh, performance. So uh, the proposed algorithm is the following, and I, I should say I like it. Uh, it's a, so you have a, always the red flag for a bioprostic valve dysfunction is when you have high velocity or gradient. So when you have a peak velocity more than three or mean gradient more than 20 on an echo uh, in a patient and a patient has a prostate valve, we're always concerned, okay, what's happening? Is this a dysfunction? Is this a mismatch? And yes, the differential diagnosis with a prostate valve is much more complex than with a native valve. Native aortic valve, if you have an elevated gradient, this is uh, probably an aortic stenosis, could be also a significant AR with a, a, a gradient that is related to the increased flow across the valve and some high flow state, but you know, vast majority of the cases, this is gonna be a, a stenosis and severe stenosis. But here, differential diagnosis is much more uh, complex and diversified. So the next step, which is, I think, good idea uh, when you see a high gradient is to look at AR because with bioprostic valve, of course, the dysfunction is, of, is often mixed. And so if you have, and the gradient could be solely related to the AR. So if you have moderate or more AR and TTE, then you, uh, this is yes, so you go on the left and you look at two parameters, the acceleration time, uh, that has some limitation, of course, because we know it is uh, chronotropy flow dependent, but is, is one parameter among several. So if it's more than 100 milliseconds and the Doppler velocity index that I always like to look at, and I think is one of the, probably one of the most useful. And by the way, Natasha showed you that in this paper, this was one of the parameters that has the best overall accuracy area under the curve. Uh, for uh, the diagnosis of obstruction with the index DOA. So if you have a DVI less than 0.25, that is your usual cutoff for uh, severe obstruction. Uh, if yes, then this is a mixed mechanism. It means that there is a component of bioprostic valve stenosis with the AR, okay? If no, then this is a pure AR, okay? Um, then you go to the case where you don't have any uh, significant AR, and the, the, the next step is to the, propose to look at three parameters. Uh, and one is very important, abnormal valve cusp. To me, this is maybe one of the, among all, 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 all the other quantitative parameters that we look at, we should look at the leaflets at the cusp. Uh, if, because if the leaflets are pristine, uh, thin and moving well, 
this is probably not a, a, a pathologic obstruction, right? It, and the gradient then is probably related to a process patient mismatch. So it is so important criteria. Uh, then the other uh, criteria is again the double velocity index less than 0.25. And the third one is a delta in AOA during follow up of more than 20%. So if the, um, the AOA has decreased of more than 20%, then this is an additional and very powerful parameter. And this is not N. So if you have any of these criteria, you, uh, you are in the yes, <laughs> in the yes category. And, and I think this uh, delta is very important because when we, we, we examine, when we assess an echo of a patient, we should always assess this echo in light of the previous echo and look more not an, a punctual assessment, but more how the, all these parameters evolve with time. And this is why it is so important to have an echo follow-up. Uh, and if yes, so of course, this is an obstruction. If no, uh, then um, uh, we, we look at the indexed AOA. Uh, that is probably the best parameter to uh, identify prosthesis patient, patient mismatch and distinguish from uh, high flow. And, and so you, you got all your categories with this algorithm using a, a multi-parameter but integrative approach and um, it's still a limited number of parameters, but I think with this parameter, you capture most of the uh, story. Um, and so, yes, now what is the performance of this newly proposed uh, uh, algorithm? Well, much better. Definitely you see on the, uh, on the, on the diagonal, diagonal of, the, of the matrix, you have uh, many more patients. There are still some patients who are outside, you know, some, some uh, uh, misclassified cases with again PPM versus obstruction always the challenge, uh, but otherwise and, and regurgitation versus mixed. Regurgitation versus mixed is well, yeah, okay, it's it's one that is more challenging. We, you clearly see that the two most challenging situation in terms of differential diagnosis is pathologic obstruction versus mismatch and regurgitation versus mixed. And, and with regard to pathologic obstruction versus mismatch, we also have to keep in mind that often patients have the, 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 the two categories at the same time. But nevertheless, you see, if you look on the right, the sensitivity, specificity, accuracy has improved uh, quite substantially versus all the other algorithm. And here there is a table I like that is summarizing well the, um, uh, the uh, um, the results and the comparison. Here, what you have is the area under the rock curve. So it's really uh, um, the uh, overall accuracy of the parameter, regardless of the cutoff that you use. And, and you see that for obstruction, we have uh, obstruction, high flow regurgitation put together and mismatch. This is for ESC algorithm. We are in the 50, 70, point, point 50, point, uh, 60, point 70. Uh, uh, with the uh, blow wet miller a little bit better, EACVI not necessarily better, and finally with the, the this recent one, then we are uh, we are we have really a, a much improvement. And I guess that the, probably the authors did a statistical comparison of the, uh, the if this area under the curve is statistically significant, but it looked like they are definitely better, significantly better with this new algorithm. We are in the uh, you know overall accuracy of. Uh, 85, 91, 88%, which is impressive. Uh, and if we uh, look at the, um, this is a, I mean, a, again, a summary of the results, but you see that, um, uh, and the, uh, the new algorithm is this blue, uh, bluish uh, bars. Um, and we see that for uh, obstruction, we have some, uh, clearly some good improvement. Uh, for high flow regurgitation, also some good improvement. So for all the, uh, dysfunction, we have some improvement. Mismatch, well, similar as all other algorithm, but again, this is maybe the most challenging one. And, and but still the overall accuracy as uh, uh, with this new algorithm, a great incremental improvement. And you see that the overall accuracy went from 57, 62% with all the others to 83%. Uh, this is rare to have, uh, you know, uh, in terms of diagnostic accuracy, a tool, a new tool that improves the accuracy that much. So I think it has a, this algorithm has certainly a great future, hopefully. So there are limitations. Of course, this is a retrospective analysis of patients in whom the uh, BAVD mechanism 
could be univocally established. So probably a selection bias because of course only the patients in whom we had a, a confirmation of the dysfunction were included. Um, so of course we need to uh, to test the accuracy of this novel algorithm in uh, in uh, in patient first with lesser degree of BAVD uh, and also um, uh, probably in other population from different centers we will need probably an independent validation and would we'll love to do so in our institution by the way uh, and uh, uh, so um, the conclusion of this uh, important study published in Jays is that uh, in a large cohort of patients with bioprostic aortic valve dysfunction, the current algorithm, including those that we have in the guideline that we use every day, had limited ability to correctly identify the mechanism of prostate valve dysfunction and so to differentiate uh, acquired through prostate valve dysfunction, uh, so actually structural dysfunction versus non-structural dysfunction and mismatch and also the type of dysfunction. And so this novel algorithm uh, proposed by the uh, group at the Mayo Clinic uh, improved the diagnosis by uh, com combining the uh, uh, visual appearance of the leaflets, again, very important, in including also color Doppler with quantitative Doppler measurements, especially, you know, DVI, um, acceleration time, and uh, the AOA are the key, uh, the key parameter to consider. And uh, on this, I just want to, uh, refer you to this reference and, and strongly suggest that you read this excellent paper that uh, has been published in JAYS. You have the reference here and uh, look forward to the discussion on this um, very elegant study. Great, thank you so much, Philippe and Natasha. That was wonderful. Uh, great summary of the paper. And I'm gonna let you guys continue with um, starting off the discussion. We're gonna open up the discussion period. If there's any questions from the audience. Um, we won't get to that just yet. And uh, okay. so uh, Philippe and Natasha, would you like to start off with uh, questions for our panelists, our authors that are present? Uh, Natasha, do you want to come first? No, if I have difficulty, I can. Uh... Okay. Um, I was wondering uh, if I understood well, you uh, you put together um, uh, aortic regurgitation and 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 an eye flow, right? Uh, it looks like it is in the same category. Um, and of course, eye flow is not a pyoprostic valve dysfunction; could be related to. I mean, eye flow often occur when you have significant AR, but it could occur independently of AR. I guess that in this category, this uh, merge category. There were many more AR than uh, pure eye flow, uh, but could you tell us a bit more why you merged the eye flow with the aortic regurgitation and what was the proportion of eye flow related to aortic regurgitation versus eye flow uh, for other different etiologies? Aslanif, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, because uh, the, the thing with the uh, high flow, we think we are putting the high flow and also the regurgitation in the same group because I think the parameters in terms of uh, when you look at the uh, acceleration time, the dimensionless index, actually for, uh, for regurgitation and high flow is actually similar. Um, so that's why we put them uh, together. Uh, in the two, I think Dr. Pislaru, maybe we want to add. Yeah, you know, so so it's it's tricky because we we try to compare three different algorithms which uh, have different bins in the outcomes, you know. So so then then it's kind of hard to 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 have some sort of uniform assessment of of the tree, and then we decide okay to 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 make things simple, we'll we'll uh, merge the two of them, um, because that allows to do a comparison that across the three algorithms rather than, than uh, do individual assessment for, for each of them. Um, I think, I think there's, there's a couple of things that are striking in this study, or at least they were to me. And Philippe, I, I, I have to say uh, with great humility that, that really the documents that ASC and the European uh, Association have put forward are really outstanding. The only one problem that, that I saw with both of them is the visual appearance uh, is highlighted in the text, but less so in the algorithm. And when you have a 40-page document, 
you know, uh, maybe some of the people will read the entire 40 pages I did, but uh, but maybe some people will will go to the to the algorithm and then that part of the look at the valve is missed. So so I I I think that's where we started. I cannot agree more. I think you know uh, the assessment of the leaflets, the visualization of the leaflet appearance, the thickness, the calcification, the uh, the tears and and the mobility are so important in the in the diagnosis and differential diagnosis of the etiology. And and by the way, I completely agree. I think it should have been in uh, encrypted in, <laughs> in the algorithm and not only in the text because um, people don't necessarily read the text as much as uh, looking at the figure. And 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 in VAR three actually um, that is not guidelines. Or it's more standardized definition for. Uh, for for research, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the assessment of leaflet morphology to uh, um, to stage uh, the um, the dysfunction. And so, stage one is when you have only morphological abnormalities. Stage two, main moderate dysfunction. But to get moderate dysfunction, structural dysfunction, you need to have stage one first. So you, meaning that it is a, a mandatory criteria, not only one of the criteria. Um, having said that, with ECHO, we all know that it is sometimes challenging to see well the leaflets, especially by TTE. So uh, that's why I think it's an important cri criteria. It should not be mandatory because sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes we have to do more. And I and, I, and in our institution, and I'm sure it's the same uh, to you. I mean, our threshold to go to TE or do a CT to better see the leaflets is, is pretty low when we have a doubt. Mm, absolutely. Uh, if if, if my, I may add something, uh, I think like like what you said, the appearance of the leaflets, I think is extremely important. I think sometimes people might uh, overestimate how difficult it is to see the leaflet even on the trans thoracic echocardiogram. If you really try to look very carefully, uh, most of the time you can really see whether there is a movement uh, abnormality of the leaflet. And sometimes just this one criteria can change the diagnosis. I recently have a pregnant lady with bioprosthetic uh, high gradient. And uh, we actually look at the leaflet and we see that two of the leaflets is not moving at all and uh, straight away clears the diagnosis. No, absolutely. I think one of the take home message for the people who are listening is that if you don't see well the leaflets uh, on TTE and you have a doubt, you know, because of the other parameters that you may have a dysfunction, don't hesitate to, uh, to do a TE or CT, uh, 40 CT2. To, to, to have a good look and, uh, at the leaflets and, and see if they are normal or not. I think this is absolutely uh, critical. One of the things, uh, uh, and Natasha, don't hesitate. Uh, I see that you are muted. I, I don't know if you have difficulty to unmute, but anyway. Um, so it, it, was it all patient with severe dysfunction or significant moderate to severe dysfunction? Because I was interested, I will tell you why I'm asking this question. Because you see the cut point, the best cut point, the optimal cut point to, uh, to identify obstruction and dysfunction was, um, if I remember well, for uh, DVI is 0.31, whereas you know the, the usual cutoff that we have in mind for CVI is 0.25, and what we have in the algorithm is 0.25. Um, same for the valve area, you know, it's not one centimeter square, it's more 1.27. Um, index 0.67, well, it's not far from the 0.65 that we use, you know, for, for severe prostate patient mismatch. But it seems that maybe the cutoff that we have maybe uh, extrapolated from the native AS uh, field are maybe too low uh, for bioprostic valve and that we should, we should start to worry uh, with a DVI at 0.30, not 0.25. Is that right? Is that your, what do you think? My my sense is uh, you're exactly right, uh, uh, Philip. I, I mean, we cannot you cannot pass too many things pass uh, Doctor Pibaro. You know, he wrote the book on flow through to the valve. So so we, so so I I absolutely agree. Um, native valve and bioprosthetic valve are, are different, and therefore probably they have slightly different numbers. Now now point three. And point three, uh, point three was the ASC document of 2009 when you start thinking about it. But point two five is the traditional one that that you use. So so I thought, well, it's not too bad. Um, yeah. Exactly. The other thing is um, flow flow dependency. Eh? <laughs> That's always uh, you know 
uh, I think, um, and that's a, another important take home message. I think first, never rely on one parameter, one single parameter. Again, you very elegantly show that we need to be multi-parametric. The beauty of ECHO is that we can measure so many parameters and we can measure the same phenomenon by different parameters. So we need to be multi-parameter. Of course, we need to say which are my best horses, on which parameter I, which I should pay attention. And I think you very well identify those parameters. But it is also important to keep in mind that I don't know, uh, except the leaflet morphology or the calcium score or things like that, uh, uh, I don't know any parameter that is a hemodynamic parameter, functional parameter that is independent of flow. All these parameters, they are flow dependent, they are chronotropic dependent, you know, the acceleration time, interestingly, is flow dependent, uh, the DVI is flow dependent. So I think this is important to keep in mind, and I was wondering if you did an, um, a separate uh, analysis in those with normal flow versus those with low flow. Because for example, for low flow, low gradient, again, native AS, we know it is much more challenging to uh, differentiate a severe versus moderate AS versus no AS, et cetera. Um, and same with bioprostic valve. As soon as the patient is in low flow and many patients are in low flow after EBR, um, well, then, you know, the gradient and velocity may be pseudo normalized. Uh, the valve and Doppler velocity index may be pseudo severe, and then you have a discordant grading. <laughs> and then, uh, so did you, um, and do you recommend maybe uh, an adaptation of your algorithm depending on whether you have normal flow or low flow? Did you eventually consider doing separate analysis and separate set of recommendation for these two categories of patients? So maybe I'll take a step at that, and then maybe I'll invite Patty to, to see what she thinks. Um, so we we thought about that, Philip. Actually, you know, so so Buzz has been part of the the guideline. Buzz Miller has been part of the 2009 guidelines and of the 2014 algorithm, and he he always felt very very um, uh, very strongly about about some of the indices in there. Uh, and when we came up with this study, he was our most vicious critic you know which is good which is good because then then if you get criticized you start looking and you say is that real or am i just daydreaming a paper and part of that discussion was was flow and we did we did the separate analysis but numbers become too small so i think i think this is an important point but but when you have only 266 patients and you take only the ones who have reduced flow it becomes much harder to say it's true it's not true because now you're you're having the 12 obstruction, 12 regurgitation, and you know, 100 obstruction. So it becomes harder. But that's an important point. I don't know, Patty. You you you've been part of the guideline, so you know you know how these things are. Yeah, this has been a great discussion. I would add that the algorithm really does need to be tested in larger numbers of patients and across institutions. One point that hasn't come up yet that I think is extremely important is getting a baseline, the fingerprint view of that prosthetic valve at some time early after it has been implanted. And that is the baseline. We need to measure the mean gradient, the peak velocity, and the effective orifice area. And, and using uh, those measurements, that, that is a guide for any significant changes that can occur in the future. Then we can make sure that we are measuring the left ventricular outflow tract diameter using the same methodology going forward. And that should be measured. We can't just assume that the prosthesis size is what the size of it should be used. Yeah, um, it is so, so important, Patty. I think. Uh... Uh, I think so important uh, take home message to, to make sure you have a good, um, either a discharge or preferably a 30 days echo that you're gonna be your baseline reference for follow-up. And, and then because I think the, well, a, a value of a parameter AOA gradients at a given time point is interesting, you know, but unless it is markedly elevated or markedly reduced, um, without having uh, known the, uh, the, 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 the starting point, you don't know anything, you know. So, for example, if you measure gradient today at seven years past uh, AVR of 27 or 30 millimeters of mercury, you say, oh, my God. But then if you look at the 30-day echo 
and the gradient was already 25 or 26, then you say, ah, okay, this is probably a prosthesis patient mismatch that is still present then. Versus if the gradient was five and it's now 30, then there is a deterioration and the OA has decreased, then it's a different story. And regarding the LVOT diameter, because it's, I see in the chat, there are several questions regarding the LVOT diameter. I agree also having a good reference baseline measurement of the LVOT diameter. And I tend, what we tend to do is to keep the same value of LVOT diameter throughout studies, because there is no reason why, uh, you know, an LVOT with a prostate valve in place will change in terms of size. It reduced the viability, you know, in the stroke volume and AOA. I think it's a, it's a good strategy. And there was one question, could we use the label size of the prosthesis as a substitute for the LVOT diameter? It has been shown by both um, our group and the group at the Mayo that no. Unfortunately, it would be simple, but you cannot because the level size from one prosthesis model to the other does not mean the same thing in terms of dimension. And plus the fact several valves are implanted supranular, et cetera, so you cannot. So you have to struggle. I know it's tough, but then difficult, but to measure the LVOT diameter uh, of the prosthesis. Um, yes, Mike. Your comment about using the same LVOT dimension over time, I would actually challenge that because if you operate on the patient with aortic stenosis who has a lot of hypertrophy and then that ventricle reverse remodels, we may find that the hypertrophy of that upper septum may reduce and we may make the LVFL tract a little larger. So I, I would, you know, as long as it's not challenging because of all the calcification, I would really encourage people to get a new LVOT dimension every time you are making that assessment on the valve. So maybe it, 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 it relies also to the fact that maybe we measure the LVOT diameter uh, differently. If you measure the LVOT diameter more, um, in, let's say five, 10 millimeter below the valve, so then you're gonna be indeed on the septal, hypertrophy septal <laughs> budge and it may change with time. We, we generally measure really the LVOT diameter uh, almost at the, at, the, at, the, at the prosthesis, just from external border of the stent to external border of the stent. And so this dimension should not change much from one visit to the other. But I think, you know, your point is well taken. And I think we, the idea is to make sure you have a reliable measurement of the LVOT because it is squared in the continuity equation. And, and, and again, Whatever, big it's, trouble. it's really <laughs> where you're sampling your Doppler is where you want to get your dimension. So, True. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I tend to, if I move up to where you're measuring and I see those valve clicks, I'm going to move it back a bit. So that's why I measure exactly. a little bit lower in the outflow track. Makes sense. What yeah. you, what what to, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention about the measurement of LVOT diameter. Uh, the measure, the, because it's squared, so a lot of people put a very high emphasis on the error of measuring the LVOT diameter. But the good thing about the LVOT diameter is that we can remeasure it after the patient has gone back home. So I think like one thing that I like to stress also is really the accurate measurement of the LVOT velocity time integral and IT valve velocity time integral and use multiple window for IT valve. Because I think this, if you don't measure this correctly, I don't you you can only correct it by asking the patient to come back to the lab. Otherwise, you know, you cannot, cannot adjust it. No, the LVOT VTI, I agree is maybe um, an underestimated source of error. It is challenging. Uh, and often you have flow acceleration in the LVOT, you may overestimate, and depending on where you put your sample volume, it's very tricky and it may change a lot. So you need to be, yeah, to pay a lot of attention on the acquisition and the tracing. And, I mean, and some people trace Doppler. outside yep. the border rather than the modal velocity. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the easiest one, is the continuous wave Doppler through the bioprostic valve, but same recommendation as for the native valve. valve. It's very important to do a multi-window interrogation, not stop after the apical chambers, uh, systematically interrogate the right sternal border because the right sternal border and suprasternal notch to a lesser extent, but this is often where you're gonna get your maximum velocity. So great uh, discussion. I think uh, there's some really good points for sonographer acquisition as well. Um, and uh, opportunity for more imaging-based discussion on this. Um, I'm going to wrap up because of the time. Um, there, there have been some really interesting questions, one from Dr. Mulvey about, you know, developing an app or, um, you know, getting, getting some of this work. Um, so even the Delta EOA 
um, to be conducted more often by labs, uh, you have a really nice algorithm and somehow translating that to an app, I think would be wonderful or um, a uh, sort of a poster that can be sent to labs and uh, for our trainees as well that can be incorporated. I think those would be the next steps. Um, and hopefully you, you guys can work on that. So I'll just uh, thank you guys for um, presenting uh, your your beautiful uh, figure and summary of, of those uh, algorithms to come up with a, a better approach. And uh, in the last uh, minute or two, um, I'm going to end here because of the time. And we always try to introduce a little bit of um, artistry to our science discussion here. And so this is the part of the talk where we want to know a little bit more about our presenters. So uh, Philippe, I want you to um, finish off by uh, you and Natasha to show us a little bit about yourself and your interest in your, your artwork that you've chosen for today. Okay, so should I share my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so hope you see well. Um, this is a, a painting from Paul Cezanne, uh, who is a painter that I like very much. He's an impressionist. And uh, the reason I, I like him very much, because the painting is great at first, as you can see, uh, but also because uh, uh, his favorite topic is the Mont uh, actually Montagne Saint Victoire, uh, that is this uh, Saint Victoire Mount that you see in the background. And the little village on the front is called Puy Loubier, very difficult to pronounce for Anglo Anglophones, uh, Puy Loubier. And, um, and uh, actually, it's very close from. Uh, the house of my parents, uh, my parents in, in uh, I mean, the, the, the house of my parents, maybe seven kilometers on the right here. So, and so we have this view from the house and um, this has been a, a great source of inspiration for, for Paul Cezanne. You know, we, we have many paintings all around the Royal, though you would see uh, often it's about uh, Saint Victoire, which is close to the, uh, the nice city of Aix-en-Provence. I strongly recommend, you know, to do the, the there is nice trail and it's, uh, uh, interestingly, although he is an impressionist, so the uh, image resolution, if we talk in terms of image, is not supposed to be uh, good because that's the purpose of an impressionist. But the accuracy and the details are amazing. This is exactly, you don't have the photo of the Montagne Saint Victoire, but it is very accurate. And by the way, here is what we call the um, Pic des Mouches in French, which is in fact, the, it would be translated in a flyer's peak <laughs> uh, in English. And actually this ridge here is a very nice rock climbing because I am also a rock climber uh, that I did. It takes a big day of climbing, hot climbing to reach the top. And then you can walk down this way uh, while they're on the left. So this is, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, art piece for, not only for the, um, um, the heart per se, but for the, the story and the, uh, the meaning that is behind for me. That's very nice, Philippe. I, I thought you would have said that this picture was very calming and relaxing to you because of the foreground. And then you mentioned the rock climbing. So um, it probably is also reminds you of some of the thrilling times you've had. So it's a really nice picture. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Natasha, we'd like to uh, see what you uh, would like to share with us. Sure. And, yeah. You can hear me okay, I think. Yes. Yeah, I don't know what happened there earlier, but um, anyway, um, uh, I'll just share this quickly. I, I just came back from uh, Barcelona. Um, I also grew up uh, learning a lot about art. So Paul Cezanne and his artwork is, is well known to me, but what I'm gonna show you is totally different and kind of opening my eyes to new art. Um, uh, my mom's an architect and, and uh, I grew up around a lot of art and architecture and was recently in Barcelona. And I saw with a new set of eyes, um, the work of Gaudi. Um, this is um, a Turkish artist. And what he does is really neat. He uses artificial intelligence and he's taken all of Gaudi, who's this famous Catalan architect who's uh, you know, um, well known for the Sagrada Familia and, and, and throughout many um, of the pieces of, 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 
of, of well-known architecture in Barcelona. Um, so this, this art artist, this digital artist has used artificial intelligence to basically take all of Gaudi's work, all of his um, basic uh, drawings and plaster casts of what he then used to model um, parts of his well-known um, uh, pieces and created this three minute immersive uh, digital art experience where if you're in the room, you kind of can experience the different aspects of, of, of Gaudi's work uh, going through time and in a sort of three minute um, uh, really, really interesting experience for me because I, you know, uh, you know, Paul Cezanne and Claude Monet and Miro and all of the um, artists from the turn of the century are what I know, but digital art and artists of the 20 first and, and current century, it's it's kind of cool stuff and the ability to use artificial intelligence in a way that I never even thought was possible. So anyway, thank you for having me. Um, this was a great opportunity for someone very new in their career to hear from some world experts and congratulations on a great paper. And I hope, um, I hope to see it validated because uh, I think that is an extremely important aspect of the work that we do when we research uh, areas like this. Thank you, Natasha. That was an excellent presentation. And um, it is really interesting how AI is changing, not just uh, echo and um, imaging, uh, but art as well. And it really brings home the the point that it's a, it's a brand new future and, and it's, uh, it's an exciting future coming up. So thanks for uh, sharing that, Natasha. So we will end there. Thanks to all of my panelists. Thanks to Dr. Picard. And please read this paper. It's in the July issue 2022 of the Journal of Medical Society. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.